All right. Uh, welcome back to our second session for today's roundtable. Uh, and so what we're going to do is spend the next hour uh, focused a bit more on sort of um, issues with information, but in a corporate um, context where we're thinking about power and wealth being critical factors. And this kind of uh, falls a little bit out of what I was saying in our at the end of our last session. There's a lot of different pieces of misinformation um, and in context. Um, but here, uh, in terms of you know the multinationals and sort of maybe similar players, um, some maybe distinct issues that we want to look at. And so that's the focus for this session. Um, I just, again, wanted to encourage the audience um, to continue to offer up their um, questions. We've seen a great, um, some great ones coming through. Uh, and uh, one of them, for example, um, was you know sort of looking at perhaps differences between authoritarian and democratic regimes and how that fits in. Um, that's going to be part of our discussion for our next roundtable, um, looking at information in the public sector. So I encourage you to join us then, and I'll give you the date at the end. Um, but again, keep adding your questions in. All right, so um, uh, to get us started, um, I thought maybe I might uh, begin with a, a public example, just to kind of um, sort of imagine, to give us an idea and something we can start talking with. Um, Exxon, Exxon Mobil, um, is currently using a Texas law, um, and it's doing that um, in the context of having been sued by a number of um, municipalities or municipal officers in California who had accused Exxon and others um, of breaking state law um, by misrepresenting or burying evidence, including evidence from its own scientists regarding climate change. So that was going on in California. Um, but Exxon then, which is based in Texas, was um, using, a, you know, I would say rather obscure Texas rule 202 uh, to try to pressure uh, the California um, uh, litigants. Uh, and the, the sort of 202 rule uh, essentially is claiming that these California lawsuits uh, against the company um, violate their uh, constitutional free speech rights, Exxon's constitutional free speech rights, uh, and that the rule allows them uh, to sort of in a very preliminary and expansive way uh, call in these officials uh, to search for evidence uh, of potential violation um, of Exxon's rights. So it's a sort of uh, a Texas rule that really gives the company a great ability to kind of go after anyone who's um, who's challenging it. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of a really interesting uh, example of you know, really trying to use a legal system to squash information or claims about having that you were bad for, you know, so we talked about, uh, uh, you know, holding, say, businesses accountable, you're starting to do it. And then, you know, the, the companies are able to come in with the another path. Um, so I just kind of wanted to put that out there and maybe get some initial reactions, observations. Um, you know, is, do you see parallels in other contexts and cases you're familiar with? So I'll open it up. I, you know, I, so oh, I'm sorry, Poppy. No, I was just gonna say, I've, I've been following this case, which I think is so fascinating and terrifying. Um, and, you know, there's there's also parallels to the oil companies bringing, you know, RICO suits against the various state attorney generals for trying to regulate climate change. Um, and I, what I, you know, to take the optimistic spin on it, I think what it shows is the power of collective action, right? When, when these different groups get together, that's what scares, uh, that's what scares the companies and that's what causes them to find these obscure rules that, you know, this sort of anti anti slap law um, that, you know, no one had ever heard of before. Um, and, you know, I don't know enough about rule 202 to know how successful this is going to be as a strategy. Um, but I do think that it shows, you know, it shows they're scared, which is not a bad thing in this context. Um, you know, that California is getting somewhere. I was just going to, because Diane, you asked, does it remind you of another case? It reminds me of Kasky versus Nike, 
uh, which uh, raised sort of a similar type of a, of a, of a context in which the corporate corporation in that, in that situation uh, used the First Amendment to, to uh, seek a dismissal. I think the case ultimately got settled before it was uh, decided by the Supreme Court. Um, but uh, that's another example of, uh, of um, suppressing uh, the inquiry uh, into whether or not Nike was lying when they were, when they, uh, were claiming they didn't use uh, child labor and, and uh, abusive practices in Indonesia. But so there's some precedent for this sort of uh, case. Uh, I just want to mention for those of you who are interested uh, in some of these cases that we'll, we'll be highlighting, um, they're included in our press review on the official uh, website for uh, the Whistling at the Fake Project. So if you, you know, are interested in sort of following up more there, I encourage you to go to the website um, and look at the press review um, category to sort of get additional information. Uh, Maurizio. Well, yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and I'm so glad to be part of this panel today, and I would like to thank you, the, first of all, Costantino and Diane for hosting this uh, wonderful panel. I'm sorry if I join you a little later than, um, than expected. Um, I just would like to um, uh, try to, I have no enough background about this case that, that Diana was talking about, uh, but what I picked up from, uh, I hope I picked it up right, uh, is that uh, uh, Section 202 is being used by the, um, by the defendant, by the corporation, um, in order to basically distract from the main um, points that the uh, plaintiffs wanted to make in California. So that is using um, is using sections of law uh, in order to um, avoid the um, the claims that are um, addressed to the to the corporation, and that made me think about a different case, which much less important probably uh, than than what you just uh, put forth. Um, that that was decided in last uh, November in a small uh, trial court of northern Italy, uh, where a uh, greenwashing case. Uh, and uh, in order to de decide that case, the judge brought up um, Business Communication Act. Uh, so basically, in order to curb uh, greenwashing practice, um, um, a pure business uh, um, uh, communication act. Um, provision was used. So that probably uh, uh, points out the, the fact that when you deal with corporation, uh, if you don't have the right tool to address the, the case and specific point, you might use different, maybe different uh, sets of rules that also that still regard and concern the business activities, but are addressed in maybe a different uh, aims naturally. And you can curb and you can bend the rules in order to address the point you really want in case you don't have the appropriate tool to act. So that maybe could be a, like a more general, more broad question, whether you can use different sets of rules in order to address uh, specific points that are not addressed by the rules themselves. Martin, did you have something you want to go next? Uh, sorry, I unmuted by mistake there, by mistake. <laughs> Joseph, I had saw you had gone on mute. Did you want to? The only question I had was um, looking at some of the actions here in the Netherlands. We've seen uh, quite a few activists, investors take positions in companies, um, particularly related to climate related uh, challenges in terms of CO2 levels. And they've used not so novel corporate uh, statutes as well as uh, international statutes. I think the Shell case is one, but there's a, a number of, um, yeah, active uh, pieces of litigation and less high uh, profile uh, courts, some that are coming, some uh, actions that uh, have been dismissed. So that's interesting. But I think what's more interesting is the actual uh, interventions by smaller investors, that is to say, at the so-called distribution or the downstream. So where it really matters is, in fact, uh, companies that have yeah uh, challenges uh, both consumer challenges it doesn't show up in proxies because mostly proxy proposals are not useful in that respect but we can see and i don't know if the legal mechanisms are really as sensitive to the kinds of pushback we'd like to have so collective action i like is one of the answers of course 
but maybe not always with the legal point going first. So maybe it's a throwback to the first paddle, which is, yeah, what do what are the preferences? That is to say, we might not need to know what the truth is, but we can push back toward what our preferences are. So looking more toward median median voter preferences about what type of information you know they'd like to have as opposed to what we have from corporate deliveries of information. That's just a point that I observe here in the Netherlands. Actually, sorry, I do have something to say after all. Um, I mean, what's interesting from a non-legal journalistic point of view is when I talked earlier about the <clears throat> the rise of of uh, libel actions, slap actions, if you like, in the in the UK, um, and specific techniques used there. But um, I'd be interested to know what um, sort of American-based or American-informed lawyers um, think of so-called kill step actions. I'm thinking of the Stephen Donziger case in particular. Um, and I mean, how generally, I mean, I think it's quite a, <laughs> I mean, journalistically, I think it's quite an, it's a much more engaging um, uh, phrase than slaps. Um, but uh, I've just noticed that uh, <clears throat> Uh, lawyers work, working for corporate entities or the ultra rich are just becoming much more sophisticated at realizing where the where the pinch points lie and where the weak points lie. And so, um, Kareem raised earlier the case of Carol Cadwallader in the UK. Um, what's ingenious about that case is they haven't they haven't sued uh, the newspaper um, and they haven't sued Carol on. The material that she used in her newspaper articles they've gone for what she did uh, in a ted talk and uh on twitter uh they've they've realized that she as a freelancer is extremely vulnerable and so they've attacked her personally um obviously uh, people here are probably aware of the uh of the stephen donziger case and and how um you know how he was targeted personally uh, and uh, I've seen it, I mean, uh, it happened in my own case, in fact, when, uh, when I was sued, um, when I was uh, working for the New Statesman, where uh, a wealthy Iraqi billionaire eased me away from my magazine and, and, and sued me directly. Um, so, you know, I think there are, there are some extremists. Are they sophisticated or are they just, um, just, just, uh tactical i don't know it, it does seem that there is a uh increasingly uh, aggressive way of going about things and carol is is the prime example of that uh when we started off poppy you had um mentioned it's unclear whether one could be optimistic or not and and it's it's not clear here that there seems to be much i guess i thought i might mention i don't know where this falls in that spectrum um the johnson and johnson baby powder asbestos and baby powder case um that's been sort of um around in in various forms for more than 20 years and um a, a 1999 case um ultimately had been dropped, so this more than 20 years ago was dropped. Uh, and the issue was whether or not there was uh, asbestos in talc and uh, whether or not the company knew and whether or not there was a problem with that. Uh, the case was dropped in, in 99 because the plaintiff um, was not able to uh, force Johnson Johnson to, through the legal mechanism, so this kind of ties back into, you know, legal arguments and, and sophistication in the court system, uh, Johnson & Johnson didn't have to turn over uh, tests and internal records um, on this subject. Um, now, 20 plus years later, actually that information is emerging, not all of it, but it is emerging in a sort of later round of, of litigation. Now that's, that's 20 years down the line. Um, um, so it's just, it can be possible, but I'm not sure that that, that suggests a lot of success for this. Um, Others have any sort of thoughts on sort of these initial kinds of examples and the reliance on whether it's specific external sort of sideways um, claims and litigation strategies on who to sue, when to sue, um, that, that help um, the larger players. 
I, I have a, a comment. Uh, and the, and there's a really nice piece in Duke Law Journal from, I think it's 2000, uh, by uh, Lopucky and Weirich uh, called uh, A theory, uh, 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 theory of Legal Strategy. Um, and it has to do with you know, what is law and to what extent is, is law objective and to what extent is it just manipulated by powerful actors. Um, and they set forth all sorts of different strategies that lawyers will quickly recognize. And one of the, one of the strategies lawyers used, always used um, in big cases is to manipulate the press, uh, to, to, point, you know, to, to uh, uh, detaint the, the jury pool uh, from which they're drawing, to, uh, to spin. Uh, uh, you know, every, and the prosecutor does it, the defense attorney does it, and everyone seems to think it's okay to uh, you know, whether it's fraudulent, whether it's not fraudulent, depends on whether it's reasonably relied upon, whether it's a statement and all these other types of things, but it is a, it is a, a reality. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, you know, the, the bigger, the more dollars that are involved, the, 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 the more likely you're going to get that. Uh, one of the books that I used to have my students read is, uh, is John Hare's uh, uh, Civil Action, uh, in which it's uh, it was a discussion of uh, all sorts of uh, uh, somewhat tainted legal strategies to, uh, to you know, bankrupt the plaintiff's attorney to get rid of the case. Uh, so I think it's just part and parcel of, uh, unfortunately, what's, what uh, seems to be the, uh, too much the norm uh, in, in legal practice. Um, Notwithstanding all the fine books on on the ethics of legal practice that are out there, I, you know, I I think that's a really important point and really interesting. Like, you know, we've had we've had cases against oil companies for decades uh, for climate change and human rights violations and other you know misinformation of various kinds. And a lot of them have not been successful and they've dragged on and they haven't gone anywhere because the oil companies have so many tools that they use at their disposal. And it, I mean, maybe it's too early to say, but it does feel like we're starting to see some degree of change there. For example, we had the, uh, the offshore contracts canceled yesterday um, by a judge from a case that was brought by environmental activists uh, claiming that they had failed to take into account climate change. And I, I think that has to be related to the point that was made earlier that we have these, you know, we have retail investors who are fighting this. We have the big, the bigger investors who are starting to fight this. We have the press, we have this multifaceted strategy, which then makes it easier for the people who are going in and doing the litigation to have the support of the public on their side, to have the support of the press on their side, and to have some degree of real information out there that um, can support the underlying facts, because obviously, you know, these cases don't take place in a vacuum. It's, it's not like, uh, you know, the lawsuit is being decided in some sort of chamber somewhere. Um, it's, all, it's all part of the public. Um, so ho hopefully we're moving that direction. You know, Poppy, I want to pick up and then Mary turn to you on, on this sort of information and, and really what's an asymmetry of information where we're thinking about the private sector and, you know, large corporations, um, you know, and, and just sort of broadly put out there, you know, what do you all think in terms of enhancing, changing, modifying existing sort of duties to disclose? Um, is that the, is that a, a greater path we should be pursuing? And is that sort of going to, is that in any way, um, uh, something that you see as useful, right? In dealing with really what you keep describing is you need to get the information, you need to understand a little better to make your case to move forward. So um, just sort of put out the issue of asymmetry. Mary. Yeah, I, I wanna be able to turn back to Poppy on this, but um, I think what's important is that the reason um, we now under the SEC's um, remit have this issue about disclosures is because it's driven by the fact that the public now cares more about not just does a company generate profit, but they're making their investment decisions. What is relevant to your investment decision is now expanded to include whether or not you're, you know, a good corporate citizen, whether you are meeting diversity goals that you say you're going to meet or um, whether you're dealing with the climate uh, crisis. Um, and so I think that's what's really interesting so that the law has to catch up with that. So that by virtue of the fact that the public has moved to expand 
how they view what is material information that's relevant to my per investment decision has now opened up this area what we're talking about here with the asymmetry of information now we're saying companies the sec is now looking to really be more concrete about what do you need to disclose because this is material information that's material to an investor's decision whether or not to buy um so i just wanted to underscore that because i think that that's to poppy's point that this isn't happening in a vacuum that this is happening because society has changed or the investing public has gotten more sophisticated or whatever you want to call it as now saying we need information we're not just buying because of this we're buying because we, we want to make conscious decisions about where our dollars are spent okay. and to to build off of that i mean in terms of our best weapon in the asymmetry of information it's it's whistleblowers uh, you know, it's people from the inside who can expose, you know, the internal communications that don't match the external communications. Um, and the best way we can get whistleblowers out there is to have things like, as Mary said, you know, the duty to disclose. If the SEC is determining that the duty to disclose climate misinformation is material to investor decisions, suddenly we have a path through the SEC whistleblower program for that information to get to regulators who have the ability to do something about it. So, um, you know, I, I think these things can really work hand in hand to, to start trying to break down that level of, uh, you know, inequality, as you say. You know, the, um, the increasing public interest, the, both Poppy, you and Mary have highlighted here in the ESG context, um, and, and sort of the idea of increasing, you know, regulatory expectations on the information that is made public to sort of decrease the asymmetry. It sort of makes me think a little bit about, and this, I came at this from sort of the tax side, but it's not, it's not really a tax um, act. The Corporate Transparency Act from January of 21 was really sort of viewed by, by many as a perhaps first major foray of the U.S. into requiring um, disclosure of beneficial ownership, something that we do see in other countries, but um, is not uh, something that the U.S. has been extremely at the forefront of. Uh, but we've seen critiques of that legislation. Now we you know, need to see it sort of play out, but we've seen some critiques that really look at the exceptions built in already. So it's not even just how it's implemented, but uh, the exceptions built into the Corporate Transparency Act, so situations in which uh, entities would not be required to disclose their beneficial ownership, um, you know, and, and sort of thinking about that as an issue of lobbying. So even when there's interest, right? So, you know, the Corporate Transparency Act, that's been floating around for a while and, you know, a variety of forces led to actually um, having it uh, passed um, a year ago. Uh, but you know, what's the what, you know, where do you see lobbying fitting in? Like, I mean, so if I if I'm the corporation and I'm seeing the you know sort of society move and maybe there's some pressure for information to be disclosed, whether it's ESG or transparency um, in beneficial ownership, uh, you know, my next round of tools is lobbying. The kind of okay, it's there, but when you look at the words, when you look at the exceptions, it's something you know that can be structured. Now, to sort of throw it open to you all to sort of you know, whether, again, examples of that or, or sort of, you know, is that just the natural process we have to live with, a back and forth? I'm not sure that I would, I'm going to directly answer your question, but I just think it's really important when you're talking about the Corporate Transparency Acts that I, I understand this to be part of what we know is the Anti-Money Laundering Act um in the united states and i think it's really important with martin on the call and journalists is that that only that is legislation that's been circulating through congress for years but it was only the fincen files investigation which was brought about by a leak from a whistleblower who now sits in jail a name a woman named natalie edwards who who leaked information about from fincen our financial criminal enforcement network network that sits under the Treasury Department that basically put pressure to say that banks are facilitating um, by slow walking some of the suspicious activity reports they're supposed to be submitting, um, the onboarding of monies from dubious sources. Um, so anyway, my, my point is that before we even get to lobbying, I want to at least recognize 
the positive origin, which is that this is a direct result of collaborative journalism um, uh, and FinCEN is what got this legislation over the line in January. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah. It, and Mary, I just would say that's a great point because I just sort of briefly hinted at, but you really laid it out. It was there for a long time and then suddenly it happens and it's really important to know why. Martin. Yeah, I mean, I think we do need to, I mean, the, the whistleblower has been slightly absent from our discussions. Um, uh, we, we have mentioned specific whistleblowers, but um, in, uh, Mary has quite rightly raised the, the, um, the issue of, of uh, Natalie Edwards. Um, what costs the whistleblower? I mean, in that case, prison, right? Um, and I do. I am slightly concerned that if we, um, if we, if we put all the emphasis on on the disclosure by whistleblowers, that we are putting too much on their shoulders. Now, clearly, I mean, Mary and I have had this discussion over the years. I mean. Uh, with the American and US attitude to whistleblower incentives. Clearly one way of doing this is actually building the incentives into the, into the system so that whistleblowers get rewarded for, uh, for what they do. But um, even so, that's pretty tough. And it's, uh, you know, it's only in very specific cases where, where that actually happens. Um, my experience of working with whistleblowers, and I hope uh, no potential whistleblowers are listening right now, uh, is that the consequences are almost always catastrophic um uh you know careers are destroyed lives are destroyed reputations are destroyed um uh even when people have well even when people have done the right thing so i think it's tricky um and uh you know you know we, we all have our um reasons for being here we all have our um um backgrounds and our own imperatives but um then we do have to be slightly careful about um about asking whistleblowers to bear the entire burden of this ethical process and diane maybe that's something for the third panel too where we talk about is there a public interest defense in terms of it gets into national security whistleblowers but natalie is really clear here is that do we have an outlet for someone within a government organization to get this information out without being jailed. Excellent, yeah, definitely want to explore whistleblowers in part three extensively. Joseph? Yeah, I would just want to pick up that uh, I agree, um, having one time representative whistleblower, at least at a, a law firm uh, pro bono, that most of the actions are either settled out of court or incredibly destructive. But on the other hand, at least in the FinCEN case, Perhaps, uh, well, this is a very bad example, but the markets were very clear in terms of pricing into the uh, stock price. Um, most of the bad banks had had heavy fines anyway. So the fact that, yeah, there was a leak, it was not so big of a spike because most people in the market knew who the bad players were. So maybe we don't have so much on the front end of uh, the concern for the whistleblower. That is, in fact, the markets priced the risk already. And legally, we haven't caught up with the fact that the whistleblowers are essentially after the fact doing what the markets had done successfully, both in Europe and the United States. So I'm not so sure about putting so much emphasis on the whistleblower, except in these really important outlier cases, which, in fact, great work in the U.S. in terms of the bounties that they've received has you know, been realized. So I'm on two minds about this uh, emphasis on the whistleblower. Yeah, thank you, Joseph. It's interesting. I'm I'm torn myself, and I, I or it brings me back to the um, issues emerging in the sort of you know 2007, 8, 9 uh, in the U.S. with tax evasion. And if you had asked, you know, officials in Treasury and IRS, do you think there's um, tax evasion? Wealthy Americans hiding assets offshore? They just said, sure, absolutely. So kind of it's like a version of the market built in. Uh, on the other hand, when it became exposed um, through the leaks, the scale and scope, um, what you tended to hear from, from those same officials was, wow, but it was so much more than I thought. 
I knew about it, but the scale was really different. So it, it always makes me wonder sort of how to fit it all together, but a great, a great point. Um, I kind of wanted to pick up, I think something maybe you, Martin, had said, or maybe Martin and Mary a little bit, but just sort of ask the question, how does corporate power and wealth affect uh, the independence of media? Just sort of how to bring that into um, this conversation. Well, I'm going I'm to try and get uh, to draw Claire out on this topic, which is um, obviously um, when you have uh, the ownership of the Washington Post um, by Jeff Bezos, how does that impact the kind of stories that are run? Um, so what what is there's a direct uh, example of and the consolidation of media. Uh, so let's start there. Yeah, I mean, we could have a whole panel on the ways in which the media is part of the problem in terms of, again, the term information disorder. Um, the most shared piece of problematic content on Facebook in the first quarter was actually an article by the Chicago Tribune, which was just a poorly written headline suggesting that a doctor had died after getting the vaccine. I mean, but in newsrooms that are absolutely squashed and desperate, uh, we have fewer people, fewer editors, et cetera, et cetera. I think to your point, Mary, about if you had anybody on this call from the Washington Post, they would make it very clear that Jeff Bezos's ownership doesn't change the editorial decisions. But there's academic work that goes back to the 1970s about the soft control that happens around ownership and production of news, et cetera, et cetera, which is relevant to think about here. But I think the more important point here is that journalism is more important than ever, yet we have had resources stripped from it. Again, many news organizations, particularly television in the US, rely on the same engagement metrics as the platforms do. So we have polarizing TV in particular, who are making decisions about their audience. As the audience is increasingly polarized, they understand that to reach those audiences and to keep them, they give them sensational content. So I think in all of those areas, the kind of conversations that we need to have in terms of thinking about solutions to information disorder, the journalism that we need is not having the support unless it's from the likes of Bezos or in the UK, Russian oligarchs, et cetera, et cetera. We need to have a much bigger conversation about ownership. There is a growing movement in the US around philanthropy and local journalism, which is great, but it's a tiny drop in the ocean compared to what we actually need um, in this space. So it's a pretty depressing <laughs> spiel, but it's true. I don't know if Martin's got thoughts, but. Kareem, did you want to comment? Not sure he heard. Oh, shall I come in and then we can go to Kareem? Sure, yeah? absolutely. Um, yeah, my, my, uh, the, journalists have always worked within, um, uh, I mean, certainly recently, actually thinking, thinking back to the origins of journalism. Um, you know, ownership has always been an issue. Uh, the rich have always um, um, used newspapers to, to further their, um, uh, their ends. Um, I can remember a conversation I had with a um, in, member of the intelligence community in the, in the UK, where I was blithely saying that um, a Balkan style war could never happen in the UK. And he turned around and said, you know, dear boy, uh, give me my own militia and my own newspaper and I could cause a war between England and Scotland tomorrow. Um, so, you know, we've, we, we as journalists, you know, all my all my friends that work in the in the Murdoch press in the UK, um, you know, they they more often than not produce excellent journalism uh, and hold uh, the powers that be to uh, account. I think the difficulty is that um, you know over the years the the Wild West that was the 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 press of the 18th century solidified into something more um, uh, manageable, uh, but we are back in the Wild West is the problem. So we don't really, we just don't have the capacity to know what we're dealing with. Uh, so I don't really know what the consequences are of um, uh, Apple producing its own content. Um, I don't really know what, I mean, I, I worry even about what, the mechanism of Twitter is doing to our brains. Um, I don't think we know 
um, it's, a, it's an experiment that's been conducted on us um, uh, that we still don't really um, understand the consequences of. Uh, so I think that's the problem is that we are in, um, you know, we, we, we have over the years had to come to uh, accommodations with media owners, but, uh, you know, at the moment we just, we, we are at sea, as you can hear from my tone, a rather rambling comment. Kareem. Yes. What? 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 what um. What's your? <laughs> what? You, what's your question? No, I thought you would um want it when we started talking about um media uh ownership and and how that affects um you know that you know sort of the basically corporate power and wealth more broadly impacting the independence of the media. So I thought you had interjected there. So yeah. I just kind of gave you a chance. Ah, okay, yeah. I mean, I just think it's interesting. Like, I, I grew up between uh, the United States and, and Egypt. Um, and I remember, you know, um, a lot of different people had all kind in, in the world of kind of international development had all kinds of theories on on how long it took for countries in the third world to develop and what was the right thing and wrong thing. And, and there was always the people in the back of the room who didn't want to really say it too loudly, but they were like, you know, you just need a benevolent dictator, you know, like what's wrong with having a good benevolent dictator. And, and of course, you know, those of us who are part of this kind of progressive human rights based thing would be like, come on, how could you say that? And now we find ourselves that in the West, you know, uh, especially the United States, where we're kind of, where, where you're in this extremely divided country and you're kind of going between one, you know, benevolent billionaire versus another, right? So it's like, you know, it, it, we're all kind of praying for a benevolent billionaire to kind of sort everything out. And I think that that's kind of just indicative of the failure of, of, of civil society that we're living in right now. And, you know, we, we, we have mechanisms, we have laws, we have antitrust, uh, history. Uh, we know that companies don't regulate themselves and can't really monitor themselves. We know all this stuff, yet somehow our inability to kind of examine our own history has led us to this place where, you know, I, I'm not against uh, Jeff Bezos owning the Washington Post. I, I'm not saying that that's like some tragedy, but what I am saying is that that that's the norm, that it's like, okay, Benioff owns time, so-and-so will sort this out, like that that's kind of how it works. I think we're, 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 we we deserve something that's a little better than that. You know, I think that we've, you know, to leave it all up to one person and their ethical framework being the salvation of the fourth estate is a little terrifying that we're even, ha that the fact that we're contemplating this um, in 2022, as we see, you know, complete, um, complete war being declared on, on the open society across the world, it really makes me worried. Um, so I, I think we we have to, you know, this is red alert. This is a thing we have to solve for. And that's why I keep going back to kind of the business model. Um, you know, I think we just have to ask ourselves, what 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 are we okay with in in Western society of, of what's what's for sale? You know, what aspects of human behavior are we okay with being for sale? Uh, what aspects of our democratic process are we okay with being for sale? And until we answer those questions, maybe we'll find that we're happy with everything being for sale. And we just, you know, we'll just surrender to the notion that some 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 of our tech wizards believe in, that in consumption we trust, and we'll just go to Mars and other places and find more resources and just keep consuming. Maybe that's it. Maybe we're just the ones who are naive, you know. But until we answer those questions, I think... Um, we won't be able to forge a new framework, a new social contract. And I believe that we're in a time where the new, uh, you know, our, 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 our user agreement, so to speak, is the new social contract. And instead of that contract being written between citizens and governments, as it used to be, it is now kind of a contract between three parties, citizens, government, and technology companies. And until we figure out who the authors of that contract should be, what they should and shouldn't be in it, and how we create the spectacle that's needed for society and the general population to feel like they can also be authors in the kind of coronation of a new contract that, that kind of administers 
a new tradition that's in line with the traditions that we all like to celebrate and are indoctrinated with in our education in the West. Until we do that, um, I don't see anything changing. Thank you. Um, I had Maurizio and then Dan. Oh, thank you. Um, actually, I tried to uh, to uh, intervene before, and so I don't know if I'm, uh, now it's still appropriate. But uh, I, I see that the, the discussion goes on uh, from the U.S. side. I just wanted to match some of the things that have been said from the U.S. perspective, from the European perspective. Um, uh, you know, Europeans are now uh, uh, more civil law oriented more than before <laughs> uh, because of Brexit. Um, so we love to put uh, our rules in writing and uh, we have a lot of piece of legislation at the European level. Uh, one is on ESG disclosure, non-financial disclosure, and that uh, ties up with uh, Poppy and I believe Martin, uh, maybe uh, uh, Mary said before about uh, ESG uh, relevance, the ESG information disclosure relevance uh, with uh, in connection with the um, with the financial markets with the uh, and. Um, and a symmetry of information between insiders and outsiders of big companies. Um, so uh, big companies in Europe are under the duty to disclose non-financial information uh, when they disclose financial information once a year at least, um, including ESG um, uh, matters. And also that uh, uh, we also have a whistleblower uh, directive, uh, 2019, entering into force this year, uh, the, the end of last 2021. Um, and that uh, I just want to quote uh, Article 1, purpose, it says, the purpose of this directive is to enhance the enforcement of union law and policies in specific areas by laying down common minimum standards, providing for a high level of protection of persons reporting breaches of union law. And that applies to antitrust, to tax law, uh, public procurement, and uh, so all sort of a business uh, um, business-related um, uh, piece of legislation that might be breached by large corporations, and therefore whistleblowers are protected uh, by this directive, which has been implemented in most of member states, including Italy. And the last point I want to make, and uh, uh, is that. Uh, um, um, uh, um, Non-financial reporting directive is 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 very important. Is becoming very important for medium-sized enterprises because it's under review of uh, European Union. It will be applied also to small and medium enterprises. Where all this is bringing uh, to, uh, to to my opinion, uh, when we said corporate power, we always need to address uh, physical uh, persons, natural persons. And those are mainly uh, directors of sitting on, and top executives. Um, on, on that respect, the European Union, uh, the Parliament of the European Union in uh, April 2021 issued a proposal of a di uh, directive that is going to impose into uh, managers and top uh, uh, and directors um, top managers and directors a duty to disclose and the duty to uh, a due diligence duty, which is basically miming uh, the Loi Pact, a uh, French piece of legislation that uh, is already imposing special duties on directors on uh, matters less, such as ESG. So that's to enlarge the, the, the scope of uh, um, director's liability uh, also to CSR uh, issues. Sorry if I'm Let's talk too long, but just would match what has been said so far. Thank you. Maurizio, I was going to say, um, I think it's great. So as we sort of are looking at problems, which are in some sense global, uh, that they are taking place also within specific uh, countries, systems, regimes. And I think that's just a great, a great reminder of the sort of value of, of keeping an eye on that. And also as we think more about solutions, or possible paths forward, part three, kind of remembering that piece. Uh, Dan, I wanted to get back to you. Yeah, I have a couple of quick comments. Um, one is a, an optimistic point. I think uh, obviously these disclosure uh, laws that we're talking about uh, are being generated uh, to benefit uh, investors. 
um, or at least that's the, the rationale behind it. But there's also a, a desire from employees to work at places that are socially responsible. And it's, there's a desire for, for customers to buy from companies that are socially responsible. So it's not just so investor driven uh, where we can get a little bit of optimism that there might be uh, more, more uh, a disclosure of, uh, uh, of truth with regard to social, uh, social issues, including the environment. Uh, I'd also like to just kind of comment on, on an earlier um, uh, sad point that, uh, that most whistleblowers suffer financially and career-wise and ruin marriages and sometimes in prison. Um, but yet when you look at the data and you read the, and, and I'm sure the, the people that work in this field already know this, um, you ask every one of them, uh, would you do it again? Uh, and they always, almost always say yes. Um, and when you teach a course in business ethics, which is I do, I had to decide 25 years ago, do I try to encourage my students to become whistleblowers or not? Uh, and I, I was team teaching with an accountant at the time, and we sat around over a, a meal and finally decided, no, we have to warn them. <laughs> we, we're not encouraging people. We're going we're gonna to set it out as an option, but make sure they know. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it, it, we do have that. And then I would also like, I would also like, we do have the fact that people do say they would do it again. Um, and, then, and then finally, uh, I would just like to comment on something that Kareem said, where I think he, I found him a little too sanguine with regard to that everyone understands that corporations can't regulate themselves. I believe we have a lot of myths in this country. And one of the biggest myths we have is what Ralph Nader calls the myth of market fundamentalism, um, that somehow markets self-regulate. And it goes all the way back to, you know, maybe the Reagan era where all of a sudden the government is the, is the, is the problem, not the, not the solution. Uh, and everyone seems to think that uh, there's also this, this uh, myth of merit that if you have billions of dollars, it's because you earned it uh, and not because you're lucky or manipulated the system. And I don't think we have a tradition of antitrust. Uh, we have, well, the antitrust laws have been on the books since 1890, but seldom enforced. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have uh, so this, this I wish that we and maybe everyone on this screen shares the idea that the markets can't self-regulate, but no, that's not a really popular uh, notion, uh, at least not in American society. I think maybe the, the European perspective might be a little bit more uh, uh, circumspect with regard to the, the fear of, the, of, of government and, 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 and business joining in a fascist regime. But over here in America, we, don't, we, don't, uh, we have a large part of our population believes that, uh, that the, uh, the markets self-regulate. Uh, there are other models of, um, of, of media ownership as well. I mean, you know, they're pretty old fashioned and um, uh, very British, but, um, you know, the, the BBC doesn't have a proprietor and um, the Guardian Media Group doesn't have a proprietor and they're pretty successful uh, media organisations. I mean, flawed in their way, hugely under attack. Well, um, I've been but, I've been but, writing but, lately. Uh, I just wrote an article on uh, in, environmental racism, and uh, a lot of the stuff on Cancer Alley that I got came out of the Guardian. And so, when you're talking about the uh, the, uh, the UK being scared of publishing anything for being fear of being sued, the Guardian seems to be pretty uh, was pretty aggressive towards the petrochemical com companies. And I don't know whether there was any repercussions there or not, but yeah, but I found no, it a little surprising that you said that, Martin. Yeah, it's, um, they have been very, uh, I, have, I have to say there are exceptions and they have been very courageous uh, and uh, particularly actually on, on that, on that issue. They're not quite so courageous with, um, in cases of individual um, wealthy, you know, we wealthy people. Um, but, you know, I have to recognise as well that uh, organisations have to prioritise and they have to make decisions and they have to decide which cases they're going to take and which, which cases that which cases they're not going to take um i would just say that you know i mean it's it's a truism really but that you know in a position where uh where newspapers financial model is under attack then they are less able to to take people on um and uh we're we're, we're not in a world now where and there used to, used to be the case that Newspapers would take on libel insurance, but they just can't afford it anymore. So they have to decide on a case by case basis. We um, have um, a little under 10 minutes left in this session. And I thought I would just shift gears a little bit. 
uh, and sort of introduce the topic of contaminated research, uh, really sort of you know broadly understood the idea of you know the dissemination of fake or misleading information um, through scientific output. Um, and just sort of think about, I, I know some of you have come across some um, some kind of really important cases in that area. And maybe we'll sort of start off talking a little bit about that if one of you would like to bring that up and just sort of um, take a look at that question. I'm happy to start. I have two examples, but why don't I start with, um... It's keeping with the theme of whistleblowers um, and sort of having a broader view of who is a whistleblower, not just the classic insider. I wanted to talk about the case of Dr. Elizabeth Bick. So Dr. Bick is a microbiologist, um, quite accomplished, who for years has been poking at from her independent um, uh, standpoint from her own organization, not she's not affiliated with any academic institution anymore. It gave her the ability to look at research that was potentially contaminated. Um, and she'd been doing this work quietly, um, you know, with much acclaim uh, in very limited circles until she was able to set her sights on the hydroxychloroquine studies. Um, and so that was at a time when Bolsonaro in Brazil and Trump were relying on hydroxychloroquine at the height of the pandemic, is that's going to be our magic bullet. Um, and I think what's so interesting here is that, again, it's this, you know, lone, in a way, it felt like a lone voice. Um, and it amplified the issue of that um, she was attacked in the most vicious way. Um, she basically attacked the, there was a French scientist who had put out the hydroxychloroquine study. There were lots of issues with that report, according to Dr. Bick, that the sample size wasn't correct and a lot of other things that she was just raising as issues. What Before we rely on the study, let's look at it critically. Um, and her home address got published on social media. She had always been subject to some, you know, isolated accounts of criticism, but, you know, there were, you know, the FBI was encouraged, there were pictures of her as a woman behind bars, other things, and it just became enormously brutal. Um, and she has also had to deal with lawsuits um, as well, and has been embroiled in that. And again, doesn't have a university backing her or any of it. So I just think it's a fascinating um, example, again, of how are we outsourcing our, to, to you know, lone courageous whistleblowers, how are we outsourcing the, the ability to, to, to police fraud and the, and, and, and inaccuracies in scientific research. So uh, I serve up Dr. Bick, um, but before I serve up, uh, I also wanted to serve up one more, but I don't know, Diane, if you want to just start talking about Dr. Bick before I serve up another one. I'm just going to make one quick comment and then bring it back to you to, to continue on. I just wanted to mention that Dr. Bick um, will be part of a special um, episode podcast um, produced by our partner, um, What Does It Profit? And she'll be interviewed together with Ivan Aransky. Um, so there'll be a great opportunity for those interested in that to kind of follow up. Uh, but I'll go back to you, Mary. Yeah, so Ivan Aransky's at um, Retraction Watch, again, another sort of watchdog organization for keeping uh, scientific accuracy. So I just think what's interesting about Dr. Beck, before I turn to the next example, is that she's been um, hailed, I think, properly as a science sleuth, but also as a whistleblower. Um, is she a whistleblower? I think there's some interesting questions on how our definition expands. I certainly think she is. But um, so that's Dr. Beck. Um, the other example I wanted to give ties into Kareem and other people's points about uh, Claire's points as well as the seduction of Silicon Valley and how funding of big uh, universities can contaminate research. So everyone loves to talk about Theranos. Me, most importantly, our client was Tyler Schultz. I'm very proud of him. I think it's fantastic. A story. It's sort of the Enron, certainly of a certain generation of, of spectacular fraud. But what's lesser known, and I wanted to talk about here, is MIT has a media lab which receives private funding. Um, and as you'll hear from the story, this is called basically the food computer scandal at MIT. I think it's much lesser known, but I think it's equally as sexy in terms of the lessons to be learned. And um, what happened there? Um, is that there was a principal research scientist by the name of Caleb Har Harper was 
promoting this thing that called the food computer, which he was going to said was going to be the create the fourth agricultural revolution. And that without light or soil, you would be able to grow um, plants under con controlled conditions and it was going to change the world. Um, and not unlike Theranos, uh, when you got down to the actual brass tax of this, it didn't work. And people were, uh, you know, basically taking plants and putting them in the computers for picture, you know, that were grown out traditionally and putting them in, in there just to, 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 for media purposes. Um, and I think what's so interesting is that it's the, what is it about the allure of these people who say they're going to change the world and that we are going to like fall so quickly and, and, you know, an institution like MIT allowing this guy like very quietly after many, many years promoting him and his work, they quietly, not so quietly, at least the New York times took him off, like had him, you know, finally fired him. But it turned out that the leader, the head of the media lab had been um, meeting with Jeffrey Epstein as well. And that Epstein related money was going in to fund the media lab and some of this research in particular. So I just think it's really interesting because of it's the intersection of private funding um, invading, uh, you know, august institutions like MIT who are trying to like create, you know, MIT is was, we're responsible for the internet. We're very grateful to MIT for things like that. But I mean, how does an institution like that allow a food computer scandal to get to the place that it did? And there is actually a whistleblower who helped bring this to light. I was going to ask, does anyone want to offer a, a comment or reaction to either of Mary's examples? No, I mean, I'll just say um, the ways in which research should itself be seen as a form of information disorder and you know Elizabeth Bick you know I followed her Twitter account before all of this happened and she was just doing amazing work pointing out all of this peer-reviewed research that was, was was not did not stand up to scrutiny I mean she's just amazing um, the one thing I'm just going to talk about is particularly the way that platforms are funding nonprofits and universities to do research or projects I mean in the misinformation space in particular they have funded they fund almost all of the fact checkers, my own organization, a, a ton of different organizations. Somebody like me as an executive director has to make a decision. Okay, I want to do an, uh, an election project. By the time I go through a Ford Foundation, it takes nine months to 18 months. I'm not gonna do it. I think it's important to do it. Okay, I'll take Google's money. But then when you see your the name of your nonprofit turn up in a transparency report given to you know the EU commission as a way of saying, this is how much we care about misinformation, it ends up having a real chilling effect on speech. And lots of times with journalists, I'll say, this has to be off the record because I can't have my name connected to the things I wanna say about the platforms. And as you can see right now, I am pretty vocal about the platforms and critical, but there's definitely some things that I've said, I've, I can't put my name to that because ultimately I have mouths to feed, I have staff to feed. And it's all of the issues that all of us face, newspaper proprietors, et cetera, about where does the money come from? What does it mean? How are your decisions shaped by that? And I think they're reflecting on the soft power. It's much more significant than we realize in terms of what's being said and what's not. So it's not new. I just wanted to add it. No, that's great, Claire. And I do think um, the, the degree to which um, almost every kind of institution and effort is impacted directly or indirectly through wealth and power and the choices that are made, um, it, it's nothing any of anybody can completely avoid. Um, but you know, it's really a struggle here to think how do you do it um, most effectively. Um, so that sadly brings us to 1225, or, or uh, um, I guess it's 225 <laughs> in UK time. Uh, couldn't quite hit everything that I hoped. We had so many interesting comments. I appreciate all of this. Um, so we're going to take our five minute break and return uh, for our final and third session. Uh, and so I look forward to seeing you all shortly. <laughs>